Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar on how the GDPR will impact your software delivery processes. Very lucky to have Richard McCaskill presenting. He's had his head in the data governance space for over 18 months now. Um, he's also a product manager, and um, he looks after our SQL data privacy suite. Now, Richard will be leading this webinar, so if you have any questions, please ask them in the questions box, and we'll aim to answer them as we go through. Uh, we've also held some time at the end if we don't get around to them. So, without further ado, let me hand over to Richard. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Karis. Okay, let's have a little look at uh, what we're going to try and do today. So, um, before we get started, just a, bit, a little bit of uh, housekeeping, a little bit of introduction to uh, Redgate, if you're not familiar with us, which I suspect most of you are, but we're, we're a software organization that's been around for actually over 17 years now, um, 18 years, um, and we've celebrated 18 years uh, six months ago. Um, but we've got extensive reach into the SQL Server community as well as being a vendor. Um, we, have, we host the two largest SQL Server specific websites, SQL Server Central and Simple Talk. We have two million registered users on there. Uh, so we're, we're very active in, a, in the conversation around uh, what we should be doing, what best practices, how we can uh, solve some of the headaches that we get as data professionals and people working with software that involves databases especially. Um, so we have tools for monitoring, for safely delivering your software, um, and for more specific uses um, like the like comparison and, uh, uh, and backup. Um, we're very, very present in most uh, uh, Fortune 100 organizations, um, and we're actively releasing. We have uh, um, a, a very active uh, product release lifecycle. Um, so we're very busy in the space of releasing software for uh, Microsoft uh, SQL Server platform especially, um, and we're involved continuously in the conversation with the community. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, my name is Richard McCaskill, you can connect with me on uh, that email address there or Data McCass on uh, Twitter, uh, please do share us with any comments. Um, so I've been around uh, in the uh, space of working with databases for over 20 years, uh, working in financial services um, uh, firms in London largely, and in the last few years I've been a product manager here at Redgate um, trying, to, trying to help as they helped me. Um, with uh, solving tricky problems, headaches around uh, databases, and especially provisioning, and then applying governance and oversight to your data estate. A little more on that later. Um, most importantly, perhaps most importantly, um, this is not legal advice. Um, so I'm not a lawyer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a technical. Uh, so I've been a developer. I've been a database administrator. I've been an IT manager, and I'm now a product manager. I'm not so never and never have been a lawyer. So please, uh, this is just a conversation. Um, but hopefully. I can help um, accelerate some of the insights uh, through some of the work that I've been doing over the, over the past 18 months, as, uh, as Kara says. Uh, I've always held it, had an interest in data governance. I've been involved in data governance projects in, uh, in previous parts of my career. I long felt that, it's, uh, that, that some, some additional oversight and structure around how we manage databases and the delivery of software into and with databases um, is something that is, you know really needs uh, uh, attention and uh, uh, and um, an improvement. Um, you know, as the old, if, uh, someone joked on Twitter, if, the, if uh, data protection was in the state that civil if civil engineering was in the state that data protection is in, uh, would anyone drive over a bridge? So that's kind of where this is coming from, uh, where the regulatory change that we're seeing is coming from. So in this webinar, we're going to have a look at some of the principles of data protection, and have a look at some of the language that's used, and um, we can just maybe have a look at some of my view on some of the practical steps that you might want to take in order to ensure compliance. Now, compliance isn't a checkbox in the case of GDPR, and for me, this is uh, to use a quote that I, I heard that I really liked um, at, a, at a conference last week, um, it is about building your defensible position under GDPR. Um, it's about making sure that you uh, are, are happy with where you stand and you can look the regulator or a supplier or, or, or a customer in the eye or internal stakeholders as well and say, yes, we, we, we think, we've thought about what we should do and here's what we've done. Um, towards the end, this, this is going to be very low on the sort of vendor pitch. Uh, I do promise it's, uh, it, we want to have the conversation. Uh, we like selling software, but we want to be part of the conversation. I'm going to discuss some of the things that Redgate's doing in order to help SQL Server professionals and the people who work with them. So first of all, um, are we going to do a poll? Yeah, we'll do a quick poll. 
So you should see pop up on your screen Hey Paul, if you could humour me, I'd, that'd be fantastic. If you could, uh, if participants could have a quick uh, sort of get get a sort of baseline for uh, um, what, where people see themselves in this journey, um, and uh, it is quite a dramatic change to many of us. Um, the implementations, something it's it's everyone's responsibility. We're, we're we're quite busy at Redgate working towards our. Um, full implementation of GDPR. Um, I'm impressed that anybody's fully prepared, but <laughs> I'm really interested to learn what that means, but it's, uh, it is quite impressive. Um, just let a couple more come in. Fantastic. A really good participation there. Thank you very much for your, for your views and for sharing that. So um, what have we got there? We've got, um, so most, uh, the largest body there are learning what it means and planning. Um, of course, it does. You know, in a sense, it's kind of late, but it's also it's also very good that we're you know we're at this stage rather than uh, rather than ignoring it, and uh, that we've got some you know real commitment to to move on this. So let's have a little look at where just for context where where this has all come from. Um, now, the, obviously, data has changed beyond recognition from the time that I started working with databases in the 1990s. Um, it was even you know basically pre-internet days. Um, with the, the 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 march of technology has seen, has seen um, a change in um, the regulation around data that frankly has trailed significantly behind. Um, so this is just somebody's view on uh, on how important data protection has has, has become. Um, more importantly, perhaps, is the the fact that data breaches are front page news. Um, everybody is now aware of Equifax and Uber and Yahoo's uh, uh, mishandling of, of our data. Uh, almost everybody has been affected in some sense, and it's a problem that's only getting worse. So the context of the GDPR has been this rising uh, tide of data breaches, this mishandling, this regular mishandling of data, and um, the, so the, data, the general data protection regulation was many years in the in 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 the works. Um, and it is this, it's the general, uh, it's the regulation of the European Parliament and the Council, 27th April 2016. Um, as we all know, it's uh, enacted with a snooze button such that the actual um, implementation of fines and penalties will not apply until 25th of May 2018, which of course is very, uh, very close indeed. It's a 50,000 word document. Um, I, I have read it. I've read lots of blog posts. I've read discussions of the uh, the working parties that have been involved in it, and been to several conferences, spoken to other experts in the field, consultants who are helping uh, uh, customers to implement GDPR. Um, so, so hopefully, some of, some of the things that, that I'll, or some of the observations will will help uh, drive accelerate understanding. Um, one, another thing about it is that it mentions the word risk 60 times. Um, the, this is a risk assessment, it's an, a recommendation above all to implement a risk assessment framework and take a risk assessment approach to managing data in the interests of the rights of the data subject. And Elizabeth Denham, the UK Information Commissioner, she's the regulator, she's in charge of um, applying the law in the UK and says, make no mistake, this one's a game changer for everyone. So I'm sure you've seen notes about you know, the size of the, of the GDPR, about how big and significant it is. So I won't dwell on that, um, except perhaps just briefly to mention that it does apply to the management of uh, the data that is the personal data of EU citizens, of EU subjects, natural persons, in the words of the law. Um, wherever uh, that data is held, and also wherever those citizens are. So a European uh, Union citizen working in the United States with their data, employment data held in the United States has the same rights as, um, as, as, as anybody, anybody else that the law covers. Um, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll need to see exactly what the, uh, what the enforcement action is like in the US, but also in, in Europe and in, in, with the, the case law is required for us to really get a sharp perspective on what's going to happen to people who don't comply, uh, to how tight the scrutiny is going to be and how harsh the punishments. Um, but the, the, the language is clear from the law that the you know, um, fines, um, remedies are intended to be dissuasive. Yeah. Um, 
In the US, larger organizations certainly are preparing for, for GDPR, according to the poll data that we can see. Um, awareness certainly isn't as widespread as it is in the UK and Europe. Um, but there's a growing awareness, I think, that the GDPR isn't a one-off. It's, 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 it's not some sort of aberration in, in the norm um, that needs to be dealt with as an isolated phenomenon. Uh, Japan has, come, has implemented uh, uh, the Act on Protection of Personal Information, which is very closely uh, and very consciously aligned with GDPR in order to minimize barriers to trade involving data. Australia, likewise, that uh, privacy amendment on notifiable data breaches. Uh, it's a 2016 bill that was passed into law in November 2017, also closely aligned with that spirit of uh, the rights of the subject to be paramount. And of course, as we, um, no doubt most of you know, uh, the UK, even post-Brexit, is committed to, um, uh, to, to implementing a very close copy. It's a Control-A, Control-C, Control-V policy approach. Um, we'll have to see how that pans out in terms of keeping aligned with the, uh, with the GDPR, um, especially when case law differs between different jurisdictions. Um, but that, but it's the, the intent is certainly there not to create barriers and to implement something in the same spirit. In the US, perhaps we are seeing some movement towards this kind of approach as well. This risk assessment, where the burden is put onto the organisation, not to not to tick boxes, um, and certainly not to shift blame or to uh, to outsource their responsibilities, but to take a risk assessment approach and own their accountability. So we're seeing a couple of things there, like the NAST is pushing towards these kind of implementations. So what's new with the GDPR? Headline news, it says that the territorial scope is different. Uh, consent is um, required to be unambiguous and freely given. And the penalties are intended to be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. Um, no doubt. And no doubt we already know that it's uh, it's, it's been um, very widely broadcast. Um, I'll drill into some of uh, what's what you know, what some of those things might mean, um, but a few other terms that it's useful to understand just to get us started. Does, I'll talk about some of the very specific definitions and jargon a little later, um, but fundamentally the roles that are involved, the people involved in um, the general data protection regulation, are the controller, the processor, and the data subject. The controller is the natural or legal person, public authority, or other body, which determines the purpose and means of processing. So it can be a person, but it's usually an organization. A processor is usually somebody who carries out um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, handling of personal data on behalf of the controller. So in most cases, the controller is going to be the, the person, the business, um, collecting the data, um, if they outsource some operations, some analytics perhaps, then the, the organization they outsource to would be the processor. And fundamentally, this is all, and this is very useful to remember, that it's all about the data subject. This is all in support of the rights of the data subject. It's not just a set of rules for rules sake. It's not a set of rules for um, compliance when you're making an assessment of whether you're doing the right thing or not, whether you're sufficiently protecting data, then it's the subject that you should be caring about. Um, and then when we talk about privacy, when we talk about um, protection of data, um, what, what are we talking about? Um, there is, it's important to understand that uh, the, it, it, not all data um, is required is to be protected on the, under the GDPR. It applies to personal data. And that's information relating to an identifiable natural person in the language of the law who can be directly or, or indirectly identified uh, in reference to an identifier. So that, that information that provides normal identification um, that can be linked back to an actual living person is considered standard personal data. It may be, for your organization, important to understand what is special personal data. Um, that's going to include political views, uh, sexual preference, medical data. Um, there's all sorts of categories that uh, biometric data, genetic data has been included there. Um, we heard at a, a conference that organizations were uninstalling um, uh, uh, fingerprints and the, the biometric recognition um, door controls because, the, uh, because they were concerned that, that that would put requirements onto them about how they store genetic data. 
Um, so you need to understand whether or not you might be holding that. By implication, of course, by defining these categories, um, there, there are another, possibly a two, two categories or, or one and a lack of category if you want to think about it that way. So the, if, you, if you're going to assert that a piece of data is personal data or another piece of data is special personal data, by implication, you need to either assert uh, or, or you know, classify, store in some way that the, other, that, the, that the data is not personal, that it doesn't fall into either of those categories. And most likely, in order to assert it with clarity, you want to know that you've not yet classified some of your data. So we've got kind of known, known other, known unknowns and unknown unknowns, I guess, um, in, a, in, in, a, in, in, in a sense. We've got the sense of personal data breaches, of course, and these, this is what the law is specifically protecting against. It's worth taking just a quick moment to understand that these aren't all the, the um, certainly not the, the characterization of hacking that we, always un that we tend to understand data breaches to be, and certainly not all the activities of a nefarious teenager in a bedroom somewhere. This is the, you know, we're talking about, yes, access by unauthorized parties, but it also covers uh, accidental loss due to action or inaction. Um, it, it involves sending data to the wrong people, um, physical devices. And then these last two categories might well fall outside people's expectations. Altering data without permission and loss of availability. I'm going to touch on what loss of availability means and what I've heard about the interpretation of that a little later as well. And then just briefly a recap of why we're doing all this. Why do we care? Um, it's in defense of the rights of data subjects. And they own these rights. They, they, they have to, these rights have to be honored unless there are special circumstances. Those circumstances can include other obligations that you have as an organization. They can include the normal processing that, that is, would be essential to, to, that, to the consented use. Um, it could be in support of other rights. So the right to erasure um, for, as, as, has been discussed on, on many forums and on the ICO uh, website um, uh, probably includes leaving a record somewhere that somebody's asked for their records not to be stored. There's, there are contradictions and difficulties. But, we, but regardless of those edge cases, we still need to kind of understand um, what the fundamental rights are of the data subject. I'll come back to those as well. So GDPR sets out a collection of principles that we need to understand in order to comply. Um, we need to, and th these, these principles are, 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 they're all framed in a way that makes us think about what we ought to be doing. Um, it's not just a, a, a list of uh, actions or, or, or operations that we need to perform. They want us to abide by the spirit of the legislation and to care about the same things that the regulators and legislators care about. So they are good data protection regulation principles um, fundamentally. So there are six of them. Uh, just briefly on each, um, we, shall, uh, we need to process lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner. Uh, transparency is about clear, being clear about what we're going to do so that the data subject has a reasonable expectation of what's going to, what we're going to do with their data. Um, and to be clear, if, uh, if, if clarification is requested, uh, so subject access requests in relation to these rights are something I'll touch on later as well. Um, we need to limit the purpose of, of the, for which we're collecting the data. So only the ones that, we require, that are required to perform the processing that the data subject um, would expect. Um, and uh, not to do things that are incompatible with the initial purposes. So we need to think about what we're going to do with them in the future. How are we going to use this, the, these pieces of information that we're collecting? Data minimization is, is, is a very interesting principle after years and years of data sprawl. So fundamentally, most, the, the, the regulators, the, the people drawing up this legislation, which they did in consultation with uh, data privacy experts um, uh, for many, many years, and which has been tweaked over, over multiple review uh, phases, the, one of the key problems has been uh, identified uh, as being uh, as being injurious to uh, the rights of data subjects is is the lack of control over where data is and the purposes for which it's maintained. 
If you don't need it, you should not be keeping it. That's the principle of data minimization. And that may change a lot about how we deal with data in our software development. Accuracy requires uh, effort. Um, uh, minimization will help, but if you're, if you're not storing all the information, reduces the risk of um, uh, performing operations on all the information. Um, if you make an assessment on a, a data subject, for example, using a stale credit rating, um, stale, uh, stale information about their circumstances, then you're breaching their rights. The limitation of storage is uh, is you know a reinforcement of uh, uh, of this of this minimization. So the limitation is um, uh, is speaking to uh, the the need to um, reduce the possibility of identification. If we are going to use data in uh, aggregations, in statistical purposes, in research purposes, then we need to care that we're not exposing personal data um, in that uh, for that need. Um, and of course, we've got to um, process data in a manner that ensures appropriate security. Appropriate, uh, this is one of these terms that we'll see again and again, um, in, in appropriate technical or organizational measures um, is, is one of the key requirements of uh, GDPR. Um, there is some guidance on what is appropriate, and we're going to come on to some of that just shortly. Um, First of all, let's have a look at some of the terms that the GDPR introduces, and we'll have a look at how those um, appropriate technical measures relate to the terms that we're, we're being asked to understand. Um, a lot of thought has gone into the, the banners that the GDPR marches under, I would say. Um, in order to really, un, really cement the, the intent of the regulators, a lot of time has been, has been given to, uh, to what these slogans, these banners are. Um, so it's, it's very well to have a, a, as clear as possible an understanding as a, of the intent of the regulator. Um, this has come out through um, through uh, working parties, um, through uh, trying to uh, uh, elicit the intent by by looking at some of the the, the activities the, the legislators undertook while they were drafting GDPR. Um, but much of it's in the language of the the, the law itself and the regulators who are implementing it. So one of the key phrases is data protection by design and by default. Um, in, the, in the words of the, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, um, and this is the source for much of the, much of the insight that, uh, uh, that, that, that you'll see here, um, I really recommend if you haven't spent time on the ico.org.uk website, then that really should be your first step. Um, I can't speak to other regulators if there's, um, uh, for, for non-UK uh, needs, um, but for English-speaking uh, implementers of GDPR, I can't think that there would be a better resource. Um, and they describe this as a general obligation to implement technical organizational measures to show that you've considered, a, considered and integrated data protection into your processing activities. Um, one word on, another quick word on the language. Um, processing um, has, is quite a loaded word for some technology professionals, I think. When I first started looking at the GDPR, it did make me think that it was talking about <clears throat> the transformation of data, the throughput of organization, and the, the, the input and output from one system to another. It made me think that uh, uh, this, is, this was about you know, ETL jobs about SSIS and technologies like that, quality um, managing technologies, uh, enterprise data management. Processing absolutely means every activity. If we can think of it as handling. Um, it certainly includes storage. Um, uh, so there was a, uh, one of the consultants to the, to the uh, House of Lords uh, committee on GDPR. Um, was very clear in a conference that I attended in London um, so about six months or so ago. Uh, the processing absolutely includes storage. And that's clear as you read through the law. So wherever you see processing, it's handling storage. Um, <clears throat> now, the, 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 the intent here is, of course, is that this is an upfront decision-making activity. You do it early. You don't do it as an afterthought. There isn't a... Um, a, a a data protection task at the end of building new IT systems for storing or accessing data, for changing your policy or strategies that might have privacy implications, 
for for um, changing the recovery time objectives that you've dictated for for a database, changing the backup policy, um, changing its failover um, uh, implementation, using the data for new purposes, pulling pieces of data together. All of these things oblige you to um, Im implement your the, implement the best measures that you can, technically by tooling, possibly by 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 the approaches that you take as a technical organization, but also organizationally. And at times, maybe the best thing you'll do is put in a, a put a piece of paper into a, into a, into a, a, a user guide or put a put something on your wiki saying that you must not do this. Maybe that's the first step. Organizational measures are there for, to be used as well. So what are appropriate technical measures? Um, this, this is obviously a key phrase that uh, requires us to think about um, what the appropriate measure is. Um, the, 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 this harks back, I think, to the risk assessment approach and the risk assessment spirit of the legislation. There isn't, the GDPR does not tell you to do A, B, or C, except that A, B, and C should be things that, uh, uh, that defend the rights of the data subject and that you should make an assessment that they are the right things to do. So, which is why there's somebody telling you that they, uh, they can make you GDPR compliant. Um, I think you have to assess the, that claim with a, possibly with a pinch of salt. Certainly if anybody tells you that there's a piece of software you can run that will make you GDPR compliant, um, that's, that's pretty hard to believe. Um, your GDPR compliance is, uh, is, is an assessment of your ability to defend yourself, to, to, to defend your position in relation to law specifically in relation to some law which doesn't have case law. Um, appropriate technical measures, so Mike, there are, there, there are some that are called out. Uh, documentation is called out. Um, in discussion about the use of, uh, of, of data encryption, pseudonymization and anonymization are explicitly called out. There's a strong implication that you need to perform oversight of the protection measures that you've implemented. There's a strong steer that uh, this is an ongoing requirement. It certainly isn't a project that you, you, you complete and then sign off on, and that is the end of the activity. The, uh, the items that will change in your circumstances, um, items will change in the legislation as case law, for example, is implemented and as new guidance is issued. And when you have procedures that are designed to do the right thing, you also need to think about what happens when they go wrong, when they're not implemented because that's important as well. How do you document something that went wrong and your remediation steps? On the documentation subjects, this is from the, the straight from the ICO, those 12 steps. If you haven't already read them, this is what you should be doing absolutely now. Um, you should document what personal data you hold, where it came from and who you share it with. Now, the, 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 the description uh, under, the, under the banner headline um, is that you should document this um, and the GDPR's accountability principle will require organizations to be able to show how they comply with data protection principles. It's that shift from tell me to show me. You can assert all, the, all you like that you're protecting data, but you need to demonstrate it. Increasingly, you'll, like, you'll be likely to demonstrate it to, to other stakeholders in your organization. Um, it's not just the regulators. Pseudonymization is worth, uh, is worth a brief, brief pause and, uh, and, and thought of uh, what it means. It's interesting that it's, that it's called out because um, the intent is to, is to defend data, but the regulators, I think, understand that we do want to reuse data. We do want to gain value from it after we've used it for the permitted purpose. But it puts in some, uh, some principles that might allow us to mitigate the risk of doing that. Remember, it's always a risk assessment. It's not, it's not that there's, there's always a, a thing that you cannot do. Um, it's, it's, it's that you must be able to justify and, and show that you're uh, complying with the intent. So this is for the purpose of minimization. It's to, it's to reduce the surface area of risk that you should consider some of the technical measures like uh, encryption is called out and pseudonymization versus anonymization. Um, in brief, pseudonymization offers a path back to identification, but the difficulty of that path is part of your risk assessment. So, for example, if you have a patient ID on, uh, on a data set which otherwise contains no other identifying information, 
and the people consuming that data uh, are, uh, have no access whatsoever to, to use that patient ID, no possibility of using it, then that's pseudonymized data um, which may be adequately protected for your circumstance. Anonymized data um, means that the data is no longer identifiable. There is a clause about given the current state of the art, so recognition that uh, our assessment of whether data truly is anonymized is not something that's fixed in time or absolutely static. It's something that you're going to have to work towards and possibly using technology to help, but you're going to have to perform a risk assessment on the re-identification risk or whether it truly is anonymous. Um, on that subject, I mean, we, uh, we've been looking at this space for quite a while at Redgate because we have a database provisioning product, um, and we've been asking the you know, our large user base, our, you know, very engaged community, um, what they do. This is con these results, by the way, are consistent with other um, results that you'll see in the Puppet uh, DevOps survey, for example. Um, actually, had slightly higher numbers for the number of people who are doing a copy down of production in order to uh, shore up, in, in order to help in their um, development, in their software development efforts. Um, development teams overwhelmingly want to use production data or a copy of production data with some uh, uh, alterations made. And I very much hope that there are alterations made um, because the rules of, you know, the principles of segregation of environments and of risk minimization certainly suggest that you should have, you know, at least uh, separate um, uh, security approaches for different environments. Um, so what is, what, what, how can we approach uh, uh, the how can we meet that need or that desire to copy down data um, without uh, breaching the GDPR, without going outside that consented use? Um, this is a, a, just a quick sketch I've put together with uh, uh, trying, to, try, trying to illustrate uh, uh, what, how you might think about your production and non-production environments. In the, in the con this is in the context of using, for example, our SQL clone product. We now have a, uh, so you most likely want to do some things to allow data to pass across that boundary. Perhaps it's like um, in the very early days of organizations getting the internet, people would actually connect the LAN to, a, to, to the internet without a firewall. That's unthinkable today, of course. Perhaps we're moving into an age where we need to think about an internal boundary between the consented and non-consented uses that apply the right protection, that mask data, that uh, replace personal data. Um, but that's that's one thing that we might consider. Um, still on the language of the GDPR, we've got this data protection impact assessment. Um, we had a data privacy impact assessment under the Data Protection Act. Um, they, they are interchangeable. The, the, the regulators make it clear about that. Um, but this is about um, considering an, an approach to, to considering in a formal way um, what needs to not what needs to be done to protect the risks to the rights of the data subject, um, and this is expected to be upfront um, ahead of those uh, those changes. And this is part of this may well be part of implementing data by privacy, uh, data privacy by design and by default. But do you always need to, Im to perform a data protection impact assessment on any change? That was surely that would grind organisations to a halt. Um, you don't have to do it on any change. The um, as you as you look through the law, you'll find that there's uh, and if you do this in the context, say, of the ICO's website uh, or other consultants' advice, um, you'll soon come across the um, some documents put together by the Article 29 Data Protection Working Party, which tries to bring some extra clarity to this. So you ought to be assessing whether or not you need to perform a data a formal data protection impact assessment. And these are the nine rules that uh, they put together in order to try and help you understand whether or not you need to do it. There's still ambiguity, of course. We've got large scale, difficult terms like this. But there are some examples there um, where, um, and if you look into the working party documents, there's some uh, quite useful examples. Um, a local retailer um, who uses a marketing service, um, they would be the and gathers information from their customers, they would likely be the, uh, the data controller. Um, they may not need to do a data protection impact assessment, but the marketing firm that they use to help target their, uh, their emails based on the data that they supplied to them um, most likely would need to do a data protection impact assessment on any change of technology, on use for scoring, 
Um, and especially if you're in evaluation situations where you're trying to um, decide what credit rating, what risk assessment, and whether or not to offer uh, a service or contract to a customer. And this is, uh, this is again, from that same article. The, the reality of the need to continuously assess whether you need to perform a data protection impact assessment strongly implies that you need to be continuously assessing risks. And this is where this oversight part comes from. You, you, you cannot fire and forget on, uh, on complying with GDPR. You have to change your approach and maintain your changed approach, your changed perspective over time. And again, just especially in relation to the rights of the data subject. So you need to know how to perform a data protection impact assessment. You also need to know how to comply with the subject access request. So these are very specific things that your organization needs to understand and needs to get a handle on. Breach notification is a statutory obligation. This is the checklist from uh, the bridge checklist from the ICO website. We tried to summarize it. Um, but it's about knowing that you, what you are going to do. Shutting the stable door after the horse is bolted, as has happened in several organizations and several famous data breach situations, um, is not acceptable and will not be accepted as uh, any kind of mitigation. Um, if you say, I didn't know, or uh, I didn't realize, or I misunderstood, you're likely to expose yourself to the full force of those punitive and dissuasive um, fines. So you need to know how to do these things. Most of all, though, you need to um, buy into the spirit of accountability. Recognize that you as an organization, not, a, not, a, a not, not an individual working in your data team or in your legal team, you as an organization, the board, are responsible for compliance with the principles. So it's the spirit of the law, not just the letter of the law. And we need to, again, imp implement those uh, principles in our policies. So what should you do? How should we go about um, uh, actually complying with the GDPR? Getting started is the first step. We need to understand what we have, what we hold, and where it is. We need to read up on the law. We need to get educate ourselves on, on what our requirements might be. But one of the very first activities is going to be understanding where your data is. You've probably got more than one database. You probably have legacy systems that are still in use, backups, copies used in development and testing, for example. Is, does any of that data contain personal information? Which category? So what exactly is your data? So discovering, finding, for example, if, you're if you care about the SQL estate, then scanning your, uh, scanning your environment for um, any instances of SQL Server where databases might be scanning your file system for backups that might be available. These are all going to be activities that you need to understand to get the full list, the full set of what you're going to try and control in the interests of data protection. Um, you need to know who's, who's accessing it and why. Are they accessing it for consented uses? If they're accessing it in its unaltered form for, say, development and test purposes or for analytics, um, you might find that that's not the consented use and it's outside um, the, uh, the, the expected use uh, that, uh, that a data subject um, uh, would, would reasonably expect. Um, absolutely crucial to, to making, making sure that you know that you're, you're doing the right thing. And can you demonstrate it? If you can't demonstrate it, then you're not complying. It, it's not a case of, as, as before, it's not a case of uh, um, I'm sure all the right things are being done. You can't be sure unless you've seen the, you've seen the information that leads you to, to be sure. You need to see, uh, not just hear, that the, uh, the, the right things are being done. On the software delivery lifecycle, so if you're, not doing, uh, if you're developing software in your organization, um, most likely you're somewhere uh, on the, what's now known as the DevOps uh, lifecycle. You, you have a software development lifecycle of some kind. You have standard approaches for checking in code to source control. You have standard approaches for building that checked in code into, uh, into, into uh, compiled code, um, running tests against it, and then releasing it um, with configuration management that's going to deliver working software without lots and lots of manual intervention, ideally with none at all. Um, now, the, the, the uses that 
if you're up somewhere on that um, DevOps path, if you've started doing those things, if you're automating these processes, then you're probably already at an advantage. You're keeping records of the tests that passed. You might want to add additional tests that help to confirm uh, aspects of your protection, for example. If you're, uh, if you're doing release management, you may have sign-off in that. If you do have a sign-off process, maybe or maybe you want to introduce one, Does the, is this a, an operation that required a data protection impact assessment? Perhaps this is where you can record it. You have a mechanism by, by which you can log information, you can store the related artifacts to give context to that information, you can store the decisions were made in the context of, say, some database documentation, some information on tests. So um, DevOps is certainly going to be an accelerator for the, the kind of record keeping. So maybe you need to think about how I'm going to maintain, persist that information over time. We think you should also be thinking about uh, the delivery of data uh, to the left in this uh, pipeline. So uh, production data, as we saw, is very often reused, and Redgate has tooling that will help you to do that in a more controlled, managed, and reportable manner. Ideally, you will not just do the right thing, but you will always do the right thing because that's what is always done. You'll set up your processes such that um, behaviors will be the ones you intend because of the classification you've given to the data, for example. And we're working on a set of tools that we think can really help accelerate organizations in a certain slice of, of, of the GDPR compliance, especially in related to the software um, development lifecycle. We have a data privacy and protection solution. So let me talk just briefly, and I'll just take a few minutes on this. I, I, I don't want to do a big vendor pitch, but we're taking a, uh, an approach to um, managing information as it moves through your SQL Server estate. So we've uh, made, we've made acquisitions. We have uh, several software teams active on uh, trying to bring together some of the existing capabilities and also to enhance them um, to help people uh, especially the people with large SQL Server estates, to cover that part of their GDPR compliance requirement. Um, we have some discovery capabilities in a tool called uh, SQL Estate Manager, um, and we can um, well, and we can run discovery upon the SQL Server estate so that we can gain some assurance on completeness of information. Um, we can map out which uh, which instances belong to which environment, and what the class of what the classification level in terms of security is um, for those uh, for those assets. Um, we we are uh, um, we 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 we're working with Microsoft by the way to to, to make sure that we've got um, uh, compatible um, classifications. Uh, there, there will be some uh, some base level capabilities coming out in the, in the Microsoft platform, which we hope to augment and enhance to to really help automate and, and tell the story about your protection policies. Um, the, with like with the classification, um, we're as it says here we're aligned to the to the Microsoft taxonomy, which is just emerging. It's a very simple taxonomy that allows just enough to be done um, to to start to implement the uh, controls appropriate to this new environment. Um, we've got some real strength on uh, protecting your data when you want to use it for other purposes. So SQL Clone and Data Masker are now available as SQL provision integrated together into, so that your, um, your copies that you want to use for non-production uh, use, perhaps non-consented use, is appropriate to the environment and you can have very tight control over what it is that's delivered. Um, your backup, your retention policies, um, the availability um, imperative is absolutely key to the GDPR. You need availability to comply with subject access requests. Um, SQL Backup is a great tool for implementing across multiple servers, multiple instances, uh, the, the, uh, a single policy without um, a huge amount of clicking and, uh, and, and uh, lots of error-prone operations in, uh, in, in SQL Agent, for example. Um, in oversight, we have um, for the for the alerting, we have one of the one of the best tools in the market for uh, monitoring. Uh, SQL Monitor uh, gives you real time alerts, al allowing you to restore availability, um, meet recovery time objectives in the quickest possible way by giving you insights into performance degradation, into events that uh, might affect your ability to. Um, uh, comply with the, the, the requirements. And SQL Estate Manager, this newer tool, um, 
uh, has an oversight is kind of a night watchman kind of uh, uh, oversight of of this of the condition of your SQL Server estates. What are the configuration settings on the servers? Are they as intended to be? Have best practices slipped, for example? And this is something we're you know actively developing to meet the emerging needs of data professionals dealing with this new these new situations. So what do we think you should do? Um, a few suggestions. The, um, the, the organization as a whole needs to be involved, um, probably most of your organization, if not all. The teams that we've spoken to that have, uh, that have brought everybody together seem to be doing a much uh, better job of this than, uh, than, than those that have had an isolated or uh, you know, uh, ad hoc uh, response to, the, to these new needs. Um, you, probably, you almost certainly want to start working on your data map. You need at least a first pass of what do I hold and where is it. Um, you need to think about how you manage for that ongoing control of the, of the data protection measures that you've implemented. You most likely will want to have a look at your software development lifecycle. Perhaps you'll need to refresh your tooling, your the, the things that you're using in your software development lifecycle. No doubt, a few some years ago, you, uh, as an organisation, you will have invested in Team City or Octopus Deploy, or um, you'll have invested in uh, TFS or Visual Studio Team Services through your through your Visual Studio licences. Um, um, retooling might be required. It might be something that's appropriate to your needs at the moment. You know, if you if you move to move to Sweden, you might have to get snow chains for your car. Um, you, you might need to look at database provisioning and automation of that. And you need to practice those responses. You need to know how to handle a data breach response, a data protection impact assessment. And remember that you'd be expected if something goes wrong or on, on inquiry by a, by a subject, by a data subject, you'll be expected to show your work. Why have you decided to do that? What was your risk assessment? So you're going to need to record these decisions uh, in order to maximize your defensible position. And keep learning to build that defensible position. So case law is coming, the landscape is changing, the advice is changing all the time. I would keep looking at the regulators' websites. Um, those working parties haven't finished reporting on some of the uh, advice and steer on some of the more ambiguous questions. Um, and keep going with it. The, there's quite a few articles now on the uh, Redgate Hub. Um, the, some of those conversations are ongoing. They're not, they're not, I assure you, they're not all just telling you to buy uh, Redgate tools. Um, it is a community uh, space. And you might find that there's uh, technology professionals in your area talking about these, uh, these needs and what they're doing. Find out what your peers are doing. Find out what um, uh, what best practices in your industry and uh, among people that you work with. Okay, hopefully that's been uh, useful and interesting. We will share those uh, this uh, these slides um, with uh, links that you'll hopefully find useful. Um, I'm just going to take some questions. Um, uh, I've got one at the top one there is when a, uh, when a database is restored and the personal data has been masked. Do we need to? I think. Do we need to prove that this has happened by showing the script and the checklist from that action? That's, a, that's an interesting point. The the, 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 the sort of evidencing that you, you'd be expected to provide, um, I don't think is specified. It's not specified in the law. Uh, this is about establishing confidence that the right thing is done and the right thing is and the right thing is always done. And as one of one of the points um, I made, and this is from previous. Um, experience with audits and um, and such like and due diligence committees. Um, if you can show that the right thing happens by design, by policy, without any extra intervention, um, then that often shortcuts the, uh, the your your process of establishing confidence. Um, whether that's with a you know with an auditor, a regulator, the due diligence committee, or, or who else, um, perhaps you know an internal state, stakeholder, your boss, your risk committee, your compliance officer. Um, so I think the, the, if you can prove that uh, or demonstrate uh, beyond reasonable doubt that what you intended to happen has happened, in all cases, like checking your backup, uh, like that monitoring is, 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 is switched on, uh, that the policy is being applied, then you're in a better situation and you'll have stronger mitigation. Um, and whether you do that by, uh, by showing the script, a word of warning if you're using scripts um, for uh, personal data masking, um, 
a regulator may, I think their first instinct is fair to say is to check the timestamp on a script. If they're auditing you on your compliance over the previous year and your timestamp says two months ago, they will ask for previous versions of the script and they want to build some confidence that the right thing was done two and a half months ago. Um, so, so it may be it may be a checklist. It may be that somebody um, performs an operation manually and uh, you know clicks something, um, and you could build that into say Octopus Deploy. Um, but better still would be to, to to have something that always does the right thing and leaves a record of what it's done. So. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, the, uh, if, you, if you want to know more, uh, just contact me, contact sales at Redgate if you want to know more about uh, our products or just to uh, talk about your needs and understand how we might be able to help. Um, we will distribute these slides. Uh, if you want to find more from our website in, in your own time, then uh, we have a, a section on our approach to data privacy and protection. And you can download SQL Data Privacy Suite today um, with a 14-day trial, as with all other Redgate products. Um, and that includes um, our mature uh, uh, flagship products for protection, SQL Monitor and SQL Backup Pro, um, along with our newer provisioning. Uh, tools, um, and along with the newest of all, the, um, the uh, uh, SQL Estate Manager for oversight of your infrastructure and classification. Thank you very much for joining us, and have a great day.